Beneath the waves of a lagoon in the South Pacific are more than 60 shipwrecks. Bombs, bullets, beach mines, all sorts of other highly explosive products on board. It's a miracle it wasn't vaporized during the attack. Most have been well documented, but one underwater explorer now believes that he has evidence of an unknown wreck, which may rewrite the history of what happened here. I came across something that was not known to be in that area. It's a bit of a mystery because we don't have records of any ship being there. What will they discover? And will it reveal the lost secrets of what has become known as the Japanese ghost fleet? Something blew up around here, I think. The seas and oceans of the world are filled with mysteries. Lost ships and lost lives. Now with cutting edge technology, new clues are being uncovered, unraveling these incredible stories and revealing their sunken secrets. More than 1,200 miles from the nearest continental landmass lies Micronesia. It's a country comprised of four island states, Kosrai, Ponpai, Yap, and Shuk. The atoll of Shuk is home to stunning beaches, crystal clear waters, and one of the most incredible underwater graveyards in the world. After World War I, Japan assumed control of Micronesia. They had intended to run the islands peacefully, but soon realized that Shuk, known then by its former name, Truk, could be of vital military importance. Truk is the absolutely perfect location for a naval base. The Japanese saw it there slap bang in the middle of the Pacific and realized that's fantastic strategically. But better still, because it's a natural coral atoll, it's the perfect anchorage point for a massive fleet. It's got natural protection. But also what the Japanese do is to augment that uh, with their own fortifications. But in 1944 came an attack by US forces on the island stronghold. More than 50 Japanese ships were sunk, many of which have since been explored and identified. In 2002, Professor Bill Jeffrey of the University of Guam was part of a project to record all of those known wrecks. When I did my research, I documented all the wrecks in the area. We were just sort of turning around and coming back towards another site, looking around with the side scan sonar. And then we came across something that was not known to be in that area. It was obviously something not natural. It was obviously a man-made feature. Now Bill thinks he's found a mysterious wreck that all other explorers have missed. It's a bit of a mystery because we don't have records of any ship being there. As he dug deeper, Bill realized that there were many ships that are still listed as missing in action more than 70 years after the war. In my research in the National Archives in, in Washington and San Francisco, I did come across a list of about 130 ships, smaller size ships, up to a couple of thousand tons that are lost. Bill is now planning to return to the lagoon to do what no other explorer could, identify this mysterious sonar image. 
if we can dive, if we can sort of record what's there, we get some dimensions of it, get some identification through other things, we might be able to marry it up to a particular ship on this list. But diving an unknown wreck in the lagoon is not something to be taken lightly. The raid on truck saw the Americans make a devastating two-day attack. And many of the Japanese ships that were sunk went down carrying explosive cargo. Ships like the San Francisco Maru. The San Francisco Maru is known as the Million Dollar Wreck. And there's a good reason for that. It's called the Million Dollar Wreck because it has that or more worth of munitions and supplies on board. She had managed to survive the first day of the attack, but on day two, she was hit by six 500-pound bombs, sending her to the bottom where her deadly cargo remains to this day. Seeing all this munitions on board, it's highly explosive material. It's a miracle this ship wasn't vaporized during the Allied attack. It's got cordite. It's got thousands of hemispherical beach mines. And actually, if you dive today onto the forward deck, you can still see three Mitsubishi Type 95 Hargo tanks. They're right there. Why was this remote atoll singled out for such a large-scale attack? The answer lies in the years leading up to World War II, when Shuk was governed by the Japanese. Gradvin Isaac grew up surrounded by the ruins of Japanese fortifications and listening to the tales of the local elders. The Japanese educate the people of Chuk, and they hired them to work for the Japanese. And uh, the Japanese really help the local people. They feed them, they give them what they want, and they pay them. Chuki's people that were there in those early days, they said it wasn't too bad. They had all sorts of facilities there, ice cream parlors, a cinema. Before the war started, some people thought that life wasn't too bad, even though it was under quite stringent Japanese control. Perhaps the unique perspective of the islanders can help solve the mystery of the strange sonar image. Identifying the wreck won't be easy. So many are littered here, and they all stem from one world-changing event. On December 7, 1941, Japan launched a surprise attack on a U.S. naval base in Hawaii. People talk about turning points of the Second World War. Believe you me, Pearl Harbor was the turning point. Truk was now a battleground which would eventually see the sinking of the Japanese fleet. Can the strange anomaly in the image paint a more vivid picture of those bloody events? In the remote Pacific island of Truk, Underwater explorer Bill Jeffrey is hoping to identify a mysterious sonar image. The origins of the story are rooted in the notorious attack on Pearl Harbor. Since the unprovoked and dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th, 1941, a state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. 
As the war progressed, life for the islanders changed. The Japanese became cruel occupiers. The people of Chuk, they work with the Japanese. The Japanese treat them like slaves. They force them to work without get paid. Truck was gradually turning in to one of the most important Japanese bases in the Pacific. Truck is not only this fantastic anchorage point for the Japanese Fourth Fleet, it's also a major place where you can ship supplies and goods in the fight against the Allies. It's got four airstrips and even a seaplane base. This is a serious, serious fortification. Eleven years after his initial discovery, Bill returns to Shuk Lagoon, his mission to finally identify the mysterious sonar anomaly. This time, he's joined by professional diver Jim Pinson. As Bill and Jim discuss the plan for tomorrow's dive, they stand on the same shoreline that witnessed the sinking of more than 50 Japanese ships. Their wrecks are scattered around the island. During the Battle of the Pacific, truck had become a real concern to America. Reconnaissance missions were showing the full extent of the fortifications on the atoll. But there was something else. Truck was also harboring Japan's largest top secret weapon. Even before the war began, Japan had embarked on an ultra secret project to create a weapon designed to counter the American fleet's greater numbers. Two B 24s from the Air Sol's command came in on reconnaissance. It was a very cloudy day. And there were destroyers and all kinds of military ships. But they did see the Yamato, and they couldn't believe they'd ever seen anything that big. It was astonishing. Yamato was not just the heaviest and most powerful ship ever built. She also represents this huge symbol. She represents the Japanese Navy's might, her technological power, her ability to absolutely trounce any opposition. This is a really attractive target for the Americans. Bill and Jim know exactly where the wreck of the Yamato lies, but their interests lie further out in the lagoon. The simple fact was that the threat to US operations in the Pacific could no longer be ignored. It would eventually lead to the attack that sunk the Japanese ships. Among them, was the mystery wreck which Bill and Jim are now determined to identify. The attack was given the code name Operation Hailstone. You have this unit called Force 58 under the American Admiral Mitcher, um, and he is going to use this to attack truck. This is a massive operation. Bill and Jim's first dive will take them to the location that was at the heart of that attack and is still littered with the weapons and bombs of that bloody day. On the island of Truck in the Pacific, Explorer Bill Jeffrey and diver Jim Pinson are on a mission to identify strange wreckage from one of the greatest U.S. naval attacks in the war. 
The lagoon is littered with wrecks from Operation Hailstone. What clues and evidence can the team find? Although the reasons are shrouded in secrecy, in February, the Japanese came to believe that a U.S. attack was imminent and evacuated their main fighting ships from truck. They left behind many working ships, cargo vessels, and merchant freighters. It was these that would soon face Operation Hailstone. U.S. Task Force 58, with its destroyers, aircraft carriers, cruisers, submarines, and warplanes, were now headed towards its target. Just before daybreak on February 16th, 1944, the order was given to attack. Bill Jeffrey, who is on truck today, preparing to search for strange wreckage from the attack, takes up the story. They all would have had their, um, their mission about what, what to bomb. You know, the 19 islands, and many of them have military facilities. They wanted to come here and bomb truck, whether it was 100 Navy ships or 10 Navy ships. They just wanted to wipe it out. This is a payback to Pearl Harbor. This is the dramatic background to Bill and Jim's quest to identify the wreckage in Truck Lagoon. Bill has learned that there was one wreck of a ship sunk during Operation Hailstone that was only discovered in the 1980s. Mysteriously, neither that ship nor its cargo turned out to be Japanese. So, what was it? The Hoki Maru was originally called the Hauraki. And in fact, she wasn't originally a Japanese ship. She was actually built by the British and then actually owned by a New Zealand shipping company. And the Japanese actually captured her when she was sailing from Fremantle to Colombo. Bill's research shows that the vessel was taken to Yokohama, where it was modified and was renamed the Hoki Maru. The Hoki arrived at truck with its cargo of supplies just weeks before Operation Hailstone. She was sunk on the first day of the attack. Bill Jeffrey has discovered that the wreck lies in 170 feet of water just east of what is now Dublon Island. And that previous dives have revealed that much of its cargo remains intact. But most intriguing of all is what was on board. Two John Deere tractors, both designed and manufactured in the USA. But for Bill and Jim, the great prize is to find what that sonar blip actually is. On the island of Truck, a team of experts is on a mission to discover the identity of mysterious wreckage from a destroyed Japanese fleet. As they piece together the clues, they've found that Truck was once the possible target for a very different and far more deadly kind of attack. During a meeting held on May 5th, 1943, members of the Military Policy Committee discussed a top secret weapons program known as the Manhattan Project. A key part of that was Truck Lagoon. Long before the Americans dropped the A-bomb on both Hiroshima and Nagasaki, 
it was actually the atoll of Truk was considered the perfect place to test this new deadly weapon. And actually, if you have a look at this top secret memo here, you can see the Americans talking about how uh, the best point of use would be on a Japanese fleet concentration in the harbor of Truk. So what the Americans wanted to do was to see what effect the atom bomb would have on ships. The plan to drop an atomic bomb on Truk never materialized but the U.S. later carried out a controlled test at another South Pacific island group. That was Bikini Atoll. It gave a chilling glimpse of what lay in store. Operation Hailstone may have been this incredibly violent all-out assault on truck, but actually as of nothing compared to what would have happened had this memo been followed and truck was nuked. Since the first wrecks were discovered here in the 1960s, the continued interest in diving the area prompted Gradvin's father, Kimiu, to open up Shook's very first dive resort, the Blue Lagoon. In the years that followed, many new wrecks were found and identified. This makes Bill's sonar image even more baffling. If so many wrecks in the lagoon have been discovered, how has it managed to remain a secret for so long? How has it been missed? And what part does it play in the Truck Lagoon story? There's only one way to find the answers. After exploring the wreck site, Bill and Jim now know they need to dive it. So it's back to the Blue Lagoon to suit up. The sonar hit was 230 feet below the surface. Jim will need to limit his time at the bottom to allow him to recompress as he resurfaces, avoiding nitrogen buildup in his blood, which will give him the bends. We're gonna spend about 30 minutes on the bottom, but we might spend up to two hours coming all the way back up. But at those depths, the bends are not the only danger. Narcosis is its not a possibility, it's a fact. You're gonna get narcosis at the depth we're going. Deeper you go, the more narcosis, just like drinking more alcohol. Problem, your body has a fight or flight reflex, that makes a narcotic effect even more. So the narcosis could be not a problem until something went wrong. Then it's a very big problem. A little bit of concern for anything that goes on like that, so a little bit more than the average diving. Jim will also have to be especially vigilant, diving any new and uncharted wreck site in the lagoon, as many of the ships were carrying explosive cargoes, much of which are still live. The locals, when I first came here 42 years ago, they would take mines and use it to dynamite fish. It's really dangerous to go into these underwater historic items, and you just have to pay attention. And as with any unfamiliar wreck, diving can present a whole host of potential risks. You don't enter into a place when, when you're underwater, you can look in and you'll see light coming out from somewhere, and that's your out. The real danger is some silting up Silting up, or silt-outs, happen when fine sediment is kicked up during a wreck dive. It can cause complete loss of visibility and orientation, which can have fatal consequences. I've been involved in recovering three dead bodies, divers that died while diving. One person, he got into a very narrow place. It silted up. And when we found him, his air, his tank was dry, uh, his regulator was still in his mouth, and he just didn't make it. 
With final checks complete and their equipment loaded onto the boat, it's time to identify the sonar image. This is Tonawas, it's the main island during Japanese time, and we're heading around the northwestern part of Tonawas and going out probably in a northeasterly direction for about a kilometre. On the way to the mystery wreck, Bill passes over another stark reminder of why the U.S. saw the assault on truck as revenge and retribution. Japanese submarine I-169 had been an important part of the attack on Pearl Harbor. It managed to get into the harbor and launch five mini-subs that went on to destroy two U.S. battleships. She's got this enormously impressive uh, military track record. And not only that, she also survives Operation Hailstone. So, you know, she's an incredibly lucky sub. But of course, that luck is going to change. When Bill and Jim arrive at the wreck site, whatever that strange blip is will be directly below them, and they'll soon find out. In Truck Lagoon, Maritime expert Bill Jeffrey and diver Bill Pinson are on a mission to identify a mystery sonar image, which could be an unidentified wreck from Operation Hailstone in 1944. Bill wonders if it could be connected to a Japanese submarine and a very dramatic story. After Operation Hailstone, those Japanese vessels that had survived the attack were on constant high alert. And on April 4th, 1944, submarine I-169 received the message all aboard had been fearing. Kusha! 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 B-24 bombers had been spotted in the sky, triggering an air raid warning. To avoid the bombers, I-169 made an emergency dive. But in their panic, the crew had left the ventilation valves open. Water flooded into the control room. The 1,400-ton submarine, with her crew of 80, were now trapped at the bottom of the lagoon with limited air and little chance of rescue. But suddenly, there was a glimmer of hope. Rescue divers were sent down to the sunken submarine and signaled to the trapped crew by banging on the hull. Hana Otamare. After confirming that there were still survivors, a rescue mission began to bring the trapped crew members to the surface. These cables start winching this submarine up. But as the submarine broke the surface, with the crew just moments away from salvation, disaster struck. added weight of all the flooded compartments snap the cables. Divers go back, bang on the side of the hull, and this time there is no reply. Bill and Jim finally arrive at the wreck coordinates close to the island of Fonamu. We're about 50 meters straight up.
As Jim is only planning to spend 20 minutes at the bottom, they deploy a remotely operated underwater vehicle to locate the wreck. The ROV makes its 260 feet descent to the ocean floor. Reaching the bottom, it begins the hunt. Come forward a bit. Seem to be in about the spot for the, the ship, I think, or whatever it is. Using a grid system, the ROV scours one section of the area shown on the sonar. Combing the ocean floor, it looks for any sign of the mysterious anomaly picked up on Bill's scan. What depth are we at? 65. Haven't found it yet. We might have to call on Jim yet. With the light fading, Jim will have to dive the other grid section and try to find it himself. Well, it's all up to you now. OK, no problem. <laughs> no, pressure. No, no pressure. No pressure. Jim dives, and on deck, all Bill can do is wait. As the light fades, so do Bill's chances of finding anything. Yeah, I think he would have signaled to us in some way that we'd, um, he'd found something. Jim had only planned to spend 20 minutes at the bottom before sending up a float to let the crew know that he's beginning to resurface. So 24 minutes. Oh, well, it's getting close to dark, isn't it? Over 40 minutes have passed and still no sign of Jim. Finally, Jim signals to let the crew know all is well. It came up a long way off the wreck. So if, if it found something, I think he would have come up a lot closer. Sometimes you win them and sometimes you don't. They'll have to wait for him to finish his recompression to find out if he's made any discoveries. I mean, obviously, you guys want to know, did I find it? Yeah. Didn't see anything in the first, like, 15, 18 minutes. Uh -huh. And it's only after about, about 20 minutes in the dive that is when I started seeing things. I found an anchor in at least three parts. And I don't know how you break an anchor. Yeah. I mean, literally, this was broken. I found what looked to be part of a the hull plating or something that was probably 12 feet across, blown through the middle like an explosion. It ripped the metal open. So something blew up around here, I think. Bill and Jim seem to have found evidence of a sinking in an area where no ships are known to have gone down. Could the dive team have discovered an as yet unknown victim of Operation Hailstone? What will a review of Jim's new wreck footage reveal? A 
A dive team exploring the waters of Truck Lagoon has made a fascinating discovery. The possible unknown wreck of a Japanese ship sunk in the U.S. attack, codenamed Operation Hailstone. The day after the dive, Bill Jeffrey and Jim Pinson meet to review the footage. Did the mysterious anomaly found on Bill's sonar scan match what Jim discovered on the ocean floor? So you can see, you know, there's obviously a feature here with Definitely. some straight lines. You measured it, it, it's about 60 meters long. It doesn't look like what you've seen, is it? Nothing had a curve like that. What I saw in the water yeah. on the dive was not that, 100% yeah. not that. Yeah. There yeah. might be some more stuff out there. Yeah. History is still a mystery. We probably have two different sites. Solved one question by adding another question, <laughs> basically. We've got two questions, now we yeah, had one got... question, now we've got two We're questions. We're making progress. <laughs> so, if the wreckage found in the lagoon was not what was seen on the scan, what was it, and where did it come from? The first thing that I ran into, so I wanted to see what it was exactly. Because yeah. I wanted to see if it was something metal, and of course it was. This yeah. is an anchor, but it's not an anchor. It's part of an anchor. Yeah. And I've never, ever seen a broken anchor before. That's a good find. Well done. This was what got me the most excited. It looked like just some twisted metal, and that's actually what it is. This is heavy-duty metal, thick gauge, wow. and it is yeah. just curled up all over. Yeah. Looks like it was blown out this way from an explosion. How big? You know, I, I did a couple arm spans, and so see. it looked like it was just, I just kind of checked, and it looked like it was two arm spans. Oh. So I would say 10 to 12 feet. I think it's all one piece. Like, you can't see most of it because it's, it's buried in the sand. What you found looks like more like debris. Yeah, it, it, it's evidence of something Massive force, yeah. massive yeah. force. Because that metal's, you know, yeah. that metal's curled over. It's not just blown like this a little bit. It's curled over. Seemed to be in the direction of where Aikoku was. The Aikoku Maru was an armed merchant cruiser of the Imperial Japanese Navy, sunk during Operation Hailstone. Since its discovery over 40 years ago, a question mark has remained over the mysterious whereabouts of its missing bow section. If what Bill and Jim have discovered really is part of the missing bow, why has it been found so far away from the main wreckage? They found parts of the bow, little bitty parts of the bow up to 200 feet away. Yeah. But, you know, we're quite a bit further away. Using the GPS coordinates, Bill has calculated that the debris found on the dive was over 650 yards from the main wreck. Just how would it have been possible for large chunks of metal to travel that kind of distance? The answer may be supplied by an eyewitness who watched from the shore. On the first day of Operation Hailstone, instead of heading for cover, Kimiyu made his way to the beach and watched the devastation unfold. And he just stayed there on the shore watching. He just was in so much in shock, especially because he had worked on those ships. He saw ships running with smoke. He said that he saw the Aikoku. Kimiyu watched as the Aikoku was struck by four bombs. Crippled but still afloat, she was attacked again, this time with a torpedo. She took a direct hit in cargo hold number one, which was full of ammunition and high explosives. That's when he saw it disappear in a mushroom cloud 
It lasted one minute and the ship was gone. The blast was so great that it had even destroyed the U.S. Avenger aircraft which had launched the torpedo, killing all three of its crew members. This is more of a debris field that was lifted up and moved over by an explosion. Yeah, yeah, yeah big, oh, that sort of jagged middle you saw. Jagged metal, that, that was, I mean, I've seen that on, on shipwrecks still attached. Yeah, yeah. I've never seen it just laying out. So that, yeah. that could have been the piece, you know, piece of the hull plating that was just blown apart. The clues suggest that what Jim and Bill have found is part of a ship destroyed by a huge explosion. It was possibly the Aikoku Maru. Even today, determined divers' ongoing research and new technology can shed new light on events that took place here more than 70 years ago. And the lagoon that saw such destruction continues to give up its secrets.